Hello everyone and welcome back to Decentralized Finance. Today we're going to discuss traditional finance. In particular, we're going to think a little bit about the problem that the system, the existing system is supposed to solve, think a little bit about how it tries to solve it, and some of the frictions that are going to be important when we discuss some of the DeFi applications. So first of all, what is the finance problem? Essentially in finance, we think that the world is full of many people who are interested in building wealth across time and across states that matter to them. One thing that we're going to talk about again and again um, is the fact that the states as we define them in finance typically are different than the states than you might think of, for example, that come from a virtual machine or um, are defined by an oracle. So uh, in the finance paradigm, uh, everyone wants to have as much wealth as possible, and in particular, wants to have as much wealth as possible in states when they need it the most. So circumstances or situations where they need it the most. The other thing is to essentially allow or make it easy for businesses to get capital that they need in order to invest in productive activities. The idea is that there's a whole bunch of entrepreneurs out there and entrepreneurs don't have access to all the resources they need to invest in factories, to buy software that they need and all these other things. So we rely on capital markets or the financial system to funnel money from people who have it sitting around and aren't really using it to entrepreneurs and essentially to productive uses. The idea then is that that invested capital in productive activities generates more and more revenue, which grows everyone's wealth. So overall, the goal of the financial system is to make resources grow as much as possible and to allocate them efficiently, both across time and across states of the world. So let me just reiterate again what a state is in finance. So when we use the word state, we're thinking about a description of a series of events or circumstances of something that could happen. And usually we use the word in reference to somebody's utility. And by utility, I mean their payoffs, things that affect their welfare. We also talk about characteristics that states can have. We think that states can be observable we think that states could be verifiable. That means that even though you see a state, you can't prove that a state happened to somebody else. If it is verifiable, you can prove that that state happened to somebody else. And we also think about states as being contractible. If a state is verifiable, so you can prove that it happened, then you can write a contract on it. Otherwise, you can't really do it. It's very difficult. We also distinguish between uh, two types of states. We think that there are some states that affect everyone. So broadly speaking, you can think about these as, you know, macroeconomic events. You can think of these as war. You can think of these as massive price changes. Um, the other type of state that we think about are states that only affect one or a few people. So these are things like my pet gets sick, my goldfish died, my house burned down. These things don't really affect you, but they really do affect me. The other concept that's useful to have in your mind is how we think about or how we use the word utility in finance. And we think that agents can rank any outcome that happens in a particular state by some ordinal measure that we're going to call utility. So, for example, if you're offered the choice between two things for dessert, either a purple pepper or a hot chocolate dessert, you could look inside yourself and say, ah, okay, hot chocolate is going to give me 20 utils, purple pepper is going to give me 10 utils. So everyone will know that I prefer hot chocolate, or I will know that I prefer hot chocolate to purple pepper as a dessert option. Once we have this idea that you can rank all these possible outcomes with the amount essentially of utility or joy that they give you, 
then we can sort of figure out how people are going to make choices. So we assign probabilities to states. We think about the choices that are available in the states. We think about the utility that agents will get in those states. And then we just take expectations. The other thing that's sort of useful to think about uh, to understand people's utility in finance is we usually think that agents don't like risk. That is, they prefer a sure thing to a lottery. And because people don't like risk, they're always going to be willing to pay an amount to avoid it. That is what the finance system is trying to solve. So how does the current system go about solving this problem? Well, the way to think about the system is that there's a whole bunch of agents and essentially what they're trying to do is they're trying to think about resources and split them up. So first of all, agents don't necessarily interact with each other directly. In the current financial system, agents interact through two objects that actually operate slightly differently. One is financial markets. You can think about financial markets as large, say, stock exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange. You can also think of financial markets as a app that you open up on your phone to decide where you're going to buy your mortgage. Both of those represent a type of marketplace. Or the other way in which agents interact in the economy is through banks or financial firms. Typically, we use banks to store uh, value, store, store our money, make payments, and financial firms typically provide us with access to financial markets if we can't enter them directly. So one of the big problems that uh, DeFi is trying to solve is to redesign financial markets and also redesign some of the activities that banks and financial firms are currently performing. Now, once agents decide that they want to interact, there's this question about how they're going to split up any resources across time and states of the world. And the way they do it typically is through financial assets. And financial assets refer to anything that describe how people are going to split up um, assets across time and states of the world. So, for example, financial assets can be stocks, they can be bonds, they can be insurance is an example of a financial asset. And essentially, you can just think of these as contracts that govern how and why real resources are divided up. The reason why these kinds of contracts, which are different from the smart contracts that you obviously learned about last week, um, is that we have a legal system that exists to enforce contracts. Um, you know that if you write a contract with somebody and they're in default or they violate it, you have recourse. You can sue them and you can get some sort of recompense for it. So the legal system enforces these kinds of contracts. The final thing that we have in the current financial system that is useful is we have regulators. We have both policymakers in Washington and we have a whole bunch of alphabet of regulatory agencies whose job it is to make sure that the system works well. So what do regulators do exactly? The basic principle behind most of the regulation is that most people who participate in financial markets are naive. And we want to make sure, or they want to make sure, that rules are in place so nobody is harmed if they participate in the financial market. As a concrete example, the Securities and Exchange Commission, or the SEC, has a whole bunch of rules on how companies can behave when they're trying to raise money for investment activities. For example, companies have very stringent disclosure rules. They have to tell you about their cash flows and they can't lie. Um, another thing, uh, another example of the type of rules that the SEC has set up is uh, fiduciary responsibility. If you have a broker who accesses financial markets for you, that broker has a mandated 
uh, requirement to work in your best interest. That means that they have to not just not lie to you, but they have to do things uh, above and beyond that threshold. Essentially, they have to take special care of you. So these are rules that are promulgated by the SEC. The other uh, sorts of regulations um, that are more political economy, perhaps in nature, are who should be able to access the system. So for example, banks face um, a series of rules about uh, it, under which they have to verify people's identities who access the financial system. And the idea he here is that we want these rules to prevent uh, criminals from making fraudulent money, money in a bad way and then managing it to enter it into the traditional system. So that's an anti-money laundering requirement. There's also a KYC or know your client requirement. This is to prevent uh, terrorists and people that we think are bad actors from accessing the financial system. So banks have an obligation to make sure that anyone who banks with them has provided government-backed documentation. The other sort of rule that's very common is uh, rules that are designed to make sure that the system is stable. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. Rules are set up so the system doesn't create its own risk. For example, banks have a bank capital regulation. That means that they have to have a certain amount of equity in their capital structure. They have to essentially be sitting on a large enough pile of cash. And they have to be sitting on a large enough pile of cash for two very particular reasons. One, if suddenly a whole bunch of people want to withdraw from the bank, they have to have enough money there. Two, um, they have to have a large enough pile of cash on hand in case some of the investments that they have made turn out badly, the company, the bank, still will not go bankrupt. Similarly, insurance companies have capital regulation. Reg uh, there's a worry that uh, because insurance companies promise to pay you sometime in the future if something bad happens to you, um, the worry is that they're going to run out of enough funds to pay off claims. And so people will have been paying into insurance companies over time, and then when it comes for them to get a payoff, they don't get it. So there's a lot of restrictions on insurance companies to ensure that they keep essentially a large enough pile of cash again. One of the reasons why these requirements are interesting and worth worthwhile to note is the requirements are in place for arguably reasonable social reasons that as a society we think are uh, useful to have. However, the costs of these regulations are borne by the regulated entities. In particular, the banks argue that uh, one of the reasons why some of the banking functions are very expensive is because they have this very, very strong regulatory burden. In a, in a future lecture, we're going to discuss more of the implications of some of this regulation, but just keep it in mind as one of the causes of costs for the, in the traditional financial system. Just a quick overview about some of the spillovers or externalities or market failures um, that regulators are trying to prevent. These words all have slightly different meanings, but for the purposes of this discussion, you can think of them as being the same thing. And roughly, when we think of an externality, we're thinking of uh, a situation where two people participate in a, in a market and their actions have a consequence for other parties, third parties that are not directly uh, part of the transaction. So for, for an example, if two people are negotiating in a marketplace and they decide to trade, that trade will automatically as a byproduct generate a price. A third party who is not part of the directly part of the trade might use that price as a piece of information that they use to take a decision. 
So the fact that the price was generated as a byproduct of economic activity is an example of the sort of externality that we're thinking about and the sort of thing that regulators want to make sure are maximized if they're good. Some externalities can be bad. So uh, we think about or we discuss things like systemic risk. Systemic risk, uh, an example of this is when one company goes bankrupt and because it goes bankrupt, other companies that have a relationship with it that weren't anticipating this bankruptcy also go down because they're essentially hit by a radical shock. Arguably, this, what, this is what happened when Lehman Brothers uh, went bankrupt. Market breakdown is an, another example of an externality. Uh, people are worried about the other participants in a market and so they withdraw from it and no trade at all happens. Uh, this potentially is a very bad thing. Bank runs. An example of a bank run is where uh, depositors anticipate that other depositors are going to withdraw their cash. They start worrying about whether or not the bank actually does have enough, a big enough pile of cash to pay out everyone. And so they try and run and come to the bank first. And because everyone is running and coming to the bank first, an overwhelming number of people come to the bank and withdraw their money. And because so many people come at the same time, the bank runs out of its pile of cash. Even though if people had decided just to leave their cash there, it would have been perfectly fine and there would have been enough for day-to-day -day operations and maybe everyone would have been better off. These three are just all examples of the sorts of um, externalities or spillovers that regulators worry quite a bit about and try to um, reduce or monitor in the system. So how do you evaluate a financial system? Obviously, we want to know if a new system like DeFi is better than a traditional system. Well, if both of the uh, systems are doing exactly the same thing, then it's pretty straightforward to compare. We just look at the costs in one versus the costs in the other, and then we're done. What's a little bit tricky is that there can be other costs and benefits that we don't observe that still are important to be evaluated. For example, if people don't participate in a market because uh, either it is too expensive for them or they don't have information about the market, whatever reason, the absence of trade is potentially a cost that should be evaluated. If uh, part of the system is developing systemic risk, but that actually hasn't been realized, that's still something that should be evaluated as part of a new system. When you think about something like systemic risk, these are rare events. So of course, in most data, we don't see them, but still a regulator and anyone evaluating a system should be worried about things like systemic risk. Another source of inefficiency are things like market power or distorted incentives. Monopolists can extract more than their fair share of uh, value from any trade. They can distort prices. So market power is a source of inefficiency that should also be evaluated. The bottom line from all this is that sometimes there are subtle and not easy to observe effects that should be taken into account when we're evaluating whether one financial system is better than another. So overall, what's the summary from all this? A financial system works well if goods are allocated to the people who value them the most and people willingly participate in the system. It's also important to have regulators or some sort of guardrails to make sure that spillovers, so these uh, effects on third parties, are managed in everyone's best interests. For those interested in these topics, there's a economic uh, discipline called mechanism design that makes some of these statements precise.
um, and it's an interesting topic to think about. That's a brief overview of the finance problem and the way that the current or traditional finance system solves that problem. The next segment is going to be about the standard financial instruments that are traded and how we can think about them as bundles of both cash flows and trading strategies.